Hello, uh, Dr. Deva Prata. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Hey, okay, you are here. Very uh, Dr. Claudia, it's, uh, uh, we are waiting for one more person who is the co-chair. Uh, just uh, like we are trying to call him. Sorry to keep my, you uh, uh, my video is not working. Can I just log out and log in once more? Yeah, please. Uh, okay. Dr. Vivek, could you join? No. I th uh, not it. I think you will I join later. His, I see his name. Uh, no, you can see, but we are not. I, I've got a shocking echo with a quite a long delay. Somebody might have two microphones on. So my video is working, Dr. Dinesh. Uh, no, your video is off. My camera is turned on, but somehow it's not swaying. Yeah, I think yeah. you can fix the camera uh, issue, uh, but can we start the session and... Uh, yes, 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 yeah. in, in the meanwhile. In, in mean okay. So, okay. yeah, so... For, I, I first, leave it to uh, you, you I, are the chair, so I leave it to you. Yes, 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 yes. So first, very good morning to all. And first, I, I, I would like to express my thanks to Dr. Prabhu Trivedi, the director of SHIMAP, and Dr. Dinesh, the organizing secretary for this wonderful one online conference. And uh, I also have a pleasure in having our co-chair, Dr. Venkata Rao, who is from CSR CMAP and who is working on uh, this plant lipidomics. So briefly introducing myself, I'm Devabrata Sarkar. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biotechnology, Indian Institute of Te Technology, Roorkee. And in this session, we have five speakers. So, Professor Claudia Vickers from Australia, myself, and then Mr. Nivedita, Mr. Dhanush, and Mr. Neha. So, this is the second session about metabolic engineering of plant specialized metabolism. So, so now I will request Professor Claudia Vickers and before she starts, scientific and industrial research organization is from Australia and Professor Vickers hold joint position as director uh, of the future platform. I'm not sure if you can the, hear me, but there's a terrible yeah. echo on the line. Mm, yeah. With yes, I can hear you. We can yes, hear yes. you. Yeah. And CSIRO, Australia Federal Research Agency. And she is also group leader at the Australian Institute of, for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology, the University of Queensland. So leads the CSIRO University of Queensland Synthetic Biology Alliance and the BUILD component of the AUS FAB Biofoundry. Her research team used the tool of system and synthetic biology for metabolic engineering of organisms for the production of industrially useful compounds. Her team developed synthetic biology toolkits for photosynthetic microbes and is so, so if you can hear me, I'm going to log out and log back in because the system is failing on me. I'll be back. Yeah, I, 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 I can hear okay. you completely. So with this note, I invite you to please join your presentations. Yeah, hello. I think uh, I think she has a problem with the 
Still my video is not working. Can you resend me the invitation again? The, this call that I accept somehow it's a, here it's turned on, but I can't see the camera. I, I think settings you can check right. Uh, check. The video settings. Yeah, we, we, we can see you. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, yes. Now, now we can see you. You are muted, Claudia. You are muted. The professor Claudia, you are muted. Your mic is muted. Okay, got it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. There was a terrible echo and I, I couldn't hear anything. So I logged out and, and just came back in now. So I'll just share my screen again. Yeah. And let's read that one. All right. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk at this forum. It was my, my first chance to come to India early this year. It was, in fact, the last international journey that I did before the coronavirus lockdown. And it was absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed my time there. Um, very wonderful, friendly people, beautiful place. Um, and it's a, it's a, it was a, a fortunate venue to be able to visit um, for the first time before we were unable to travel anymore. So thank you very much to the organisers um, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I changed the title slightly because I wanted to, to sort of angle this more towards plant natural products and plant natural products and, and microbes. So I'm now, and with the CSIRO, I'm director of the Future Science Platform in Synthetic Biology. I actually used to be with University of Queensland, but I'm no longer with UQ anymore. Um, so really the, the focus of this work is to recognise that we need to shift from a fossil-based economy, which is unsustainable, to a circular bio-based economy. And I'm not really going to spend much time talking through that because I don't think it's uh, something that's uh, um, up for debate at the moment. Um, the second bit of background is that biology is really this generation's revolution in technology. So we've been through all these revolutions in history and right now we have a level of uh, precision and ability to engineer in biology that's unprecedented. Um, and we have been engineering with biology for a long time and this thing called synthetic biology has come along a bit more recently, which is really a, a more complex way of being able to engineer biology in that it applies engineering principles to biology. We use standardized DNA encoded parts, we use concepts of abstraction, hierarchy to recombine those parts and build more complex devices and, and whole organisms. We also do iterative design, build, test and learn cycles to Im improve and improve and improve on a particular design until it works effectively. And of course, we then take that through um, the impact pathway from scale up to market. The other specific thing about synthetic biology that sets it apart from classical engineering is that it uses automation. And automation, in particular, combined with standardized parts allows us to interrogate really large solution spaces of, of, a, of collections of, pro of solutions to particular problems and allows us to do that in very short times, uh, generate extremely large data sets and, and then use artificial intelligence and, and similar algorithms to identify information that we wouldn't otherwise be able to identify. And that's a really key component of both the design and learn component of the design build test learn cycle. Um, the advantage that, that gives us is precision and predictability, sophistication and speed with respect to classical engineering. And an example of um, 
evolution as being a, a relatively limited technology. So evolution gives you a solution, but it doesn't necessarily give you an optimal solution. It gives you a solution that allows you to complete, compete with the guy next door better than you might otherwise be able to compete or at least as well. An example is a, the limited ability that has been evolved in nature to fix plants. So plants have only two different ways that they've evolved to fix plants, C4 and, and CAM and CCB, whereas prokaryotes have evolved uh, half a dozen different ways um, to fix carbon. However, if you look at the theoretical pathway space, if you generate a theoretical pathway space, then there are many, many other pathways that might theoretically exist to fix carbon. And some of those are now being explored through the work of Toby Erb and, and, and various other people. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could explore more in that space? Um, I'm uh, not, a, not a photosynthesis person, but I'm interested in a group of natural products called terpenes. And I know that they have already been um, presented quite a lot in this particular forum, so I don't need to explain the background to you. Um, they have lots of different uh, natural uh, applications and cell membrane componentry and protein targeting and flavors and fragrances and tritrophic interactions and uh, many of the plant hormones. Um, but they also have a lot of potential for industrial applications from high value, relatively low volume products like pharmaceuticals and artemisinin is the classic one there, um, all the way through to fuels and, and fuel additives that are relatively low value and very high volume and much more uh, challenging to achieve in terms of the rates, yields and titers required. And then everything in between um, in terms of industrial chemicals, agricultural chemicals, food additives, etc. When they're sourced in their normal um, plant environment, so, so most of these are coming from plants, and, and typically they aren't exploitable industrially because they're not abundant enough, production is variable, they're hard to extract or purify, or hard to synthesize chemically, and too expensive, expensive. So it's just not um, viable. So what we do is take those pathways and um, reconstruct them in, in a variety of different types of microbes, primarily yeast, but other organisms as well. And we use those to engineer, metabolic engineer, to get um, increased production. So again, I don't need to explain the background here for you. I'm sure that you've come across that we have two different isoprenoid pathways, a mevalonate pathway, which is a, a sort of a eukaryotic pathway and a MET pathway, which is a more like a prokaryotic pathway. And they both produce these isopentanol pyrophosphate and dimethyl allopyrophosphate phosphate molecules, which are the, the standard five carbon building blocks um, for all isoprenoids. Um, Prenyl phosphate metabolism is common downstream of those two pathways and you get a series of condensation reactions to give you a C10, um, duranyl pyrophosphate, a C15, phenyl pyrophosphate, a C20 and so on and so forth. And those are um, dephosphorylated, cyclized, modified in all sorts of different ways to give you something like 70,000 different isoprenoid combinants that have been found in nature to date. Many different biological and industrial functions. We first got into engineering these, we were looking at a, a, trying to make a C10 compound, which for reasons I'll explain shortly is quite challenging. Um, many different industrial applications for 10 carbon uh, monoterpene compounds. Um, the one we were looking at was aviation fuel at the time, um, but you can actually pivot and, and make lots of different things from, uh, from C10 compounds. Um, so it turns out that if you blend a mixture of uh, C15 called farnesine and uh, C10 called limonene, which is the, the the fragrance of um, citrus fruits and a C10 called chymine, then it has very similar burn properties to Jet A1 fuel. So that's great, except that it's really hard to make uh, monoterpenes in uh, microbial cells. If you introduce a limonene synthase, if you're trying to make limonene, then you only get a teeny tiny amount of limonene. And the problem is, is that the, the phenosyl pyrophosphate synthase is actually a bifunctional enzyme, and it doesn't release very much of the C10 precursor from the active site before it goes on to make the C15 compound. So in order to improve that, you need to introduce a dedicated geronyl pyrophosphate synthase. And we tried various different ones and found that the most successful one to use was a mutation of the uh, native enzyme, the native phenosyl pyrophosphate synthase, that excludes the C15 moiety from the active site so that the C10 is released and becomes available for um, converting into limonene. So we developed a whole lot of different um, uh, vectors actually that we used to do these experiments because we needed to be testing a number of genes in parallel. And I won't go into detail around these, but um, suffice to mention if you're working with yeast and you're interested in using antibiotic selection vectors instead of um, auxotrophies, uh, then there's a whole set of these available at Adgene. 
Um, we got, uh, with various different messing around with different promoters and terminators and gene combinations, etc., we got a 250-fold increase in limonene, which is really exciting, except that when you start from not very much limonene at all, then 250-fold increase only gives you 25 milligrams per, mil per litre, which is not a very impressive um, titer. So we've done quite a lot of optimization around expression and translation and transcription there, but we still didn't get very, very good production. So we went to take a look at the um, mevalonate pathway intermediates going from central carbon metabolism on the left here all the way through the mevalonate pathway intermediates and the prenyl phosphates. And we saw that we were actually getting a massively increased pool of um, prenyl phosphates being made, but that we weren't getting conversion of the geranyl pyrophosphate through to the limonene. And this is really classical in, in isoprenoid uh, engineering. The terpene synthases are not very efficient enzymes. There are various solutions that you can use that engineering the enzymes isn't very effective. It often involves putting multiple copies onto the, the chromosome. Um, we then um, turned our attention to another problem that we were struggling with, and that is um, a problem of enzymes that are extremely stable inside the yeast. And so we were looking at enzymes that um, either can't be transcriptionally controlled because they're so stable that, that even down-regulating transcription doesn't affect their levels, or have other mechanisms for feedback control, etc., which means that transcriptional uh, down-regulation doesn't work very well. So we were looking at protein degradation as a targeted metabolic engineering strategy. And we targeted this particular node that is catalyzed by an enzyme called erg 9 or squalene synthase. And we're looking at making a C15 um, from the phenylsal pyrophosphate in this example. Now, erg 9 can be downregulated transcriptionally, but we're just using this as a proof of concept. So this, the uh, postdoc or student at the time, postdoc now who's working on this, was interested in neurolidol that has lots of different um, industrial applications. So we in introduced a neurolidol synthase into the yeast and got a little bit of neurolidol produced. The squalene and agostral levels stayed pretty similar. He then um, massively upregulated flux through the mevalonate pathway by reconstructing a novel mevalonate pathway. And he got a lot more neurolidol, but most of the carbon was channeled into squalene, which is a little bit disappointing. Uh, he then looked at this ERG9 and did some um, location analysis by tagging it with green fluorescent protein. And he determined that it was indeed endoplasmic reticulum uh, associated protein, which is what was predicted from a targeting sequence. He then attached a endoplasmic reticulum associated degradation signal known as a pest signal. And he found that both the control and the pest tagged um, strain grew at the same way and the same rate but that the um, green fluorescent protein fluorescence, which was as a proxy for how much ERG9 there was in the cell, was much lower um, on average, even from the beginning of the fermentation, um, than the, the wild type. And so he introduced that mutation to down, de decrease ERG9 activity, and he doubled the amount of neurolidol that came out. The squalene levels dropped back to where they used to be, and even the ergosterol levels decreased a little bit. So the carbon was really being channeled in, through this pathway and into neurolidol production. So this is a very uh, classical uh, metabolic engineering um, technique, but a new approach using protein degradation. Now, we also have spent a lot of time in the lab characterizing different synthetic biology components and particular promoters. And I'm not going to go into detail for all these experiments. I just really want to point out that there's a lot of very well characterized component tree that uh, responds to different carbon sources at different stages in the bioprocess, so in, in exponential phase and, and stationary phase across the dioxic shift, um, and an expanded uh, galactose promoter kit, which is a, was a workhorse in, in the industry and, and yeast engineering. So go have a look at those um, papers if you want to know more about those. And combining different types of promoters and different systems in this pathway engineering, um, Bingham was able to actually get 400 milligrams per litre of neurolidol in a batch culture, and then six grams per litre in a fed batch culture. And this is really impressive. This is industrial levels of, of production. Um, he then turned his attention to uh, the 10 carbon um, node and looked at targeting that phenosyl pyrophosphate, which is impossible. You cannot knock it out because it's a, a um, essential enzyme. Uh, and you cannot downregulate it effectively because the protein is so stable that even transcriptional downregulation doesn't affect its levels very much. So Bingen developed a degron approach to tagging those, those proteins for, for degradation. This is a cytosolic 
uh, protein. And he used these degrons, which are extremely um, savage and extremely effective at targeting proteins for, for degradation. And when you tag green fluorescent proteins, these are the three different uh, degrons here, then they decrease the half-life of GFP from about 60 hours to about 20 minutes in the, in the most uh, savage approach. And when he reconstructed uh, yeast strains with uh, degron tagged pyrophosphate synthase using the strongest degron, he didn't get anything back. It was lethal. And so what he then did was use a combinatorial approach um, by combining a variety of different degrons with a variety of different promoters. So inserting the, the degron in, a, in the promoter upstream of ERG20 and using feedback responsive, uh, sterile responsive elements from other promoters so that when the agosterol levels sank, decreased in the cell, you'd get an upregulation of transcription. So you could balance transcriptional um, uh, transcription and, and, and production of the protein with degradation of the protein. And he combined a number of different um, engineered promoters and degrons and ultimately was able to get strains back from that approach. And he was able to get 76 milligrams per litre of limonene in batch culture. So that's three times what we were originally seeing. Um, still not very much, um, but we can currently get uh, using other approaches that um, I can't talk about yet because they're going under patent. We can currently get uh, multiple grams per litre of monoterpenes from these, uh, these combination of various approaches here. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure how far we're in because we started quite late and I didn't do a time check, but can someone please interrupt me if I'm going too far over time? So I've got another little story uh, that I wanted to tell you. It's not a very long story and I think we've got time to tell it. One of the projects that we're looking at at the moment is a product called stragalactone. It's a plant hormone and it's really interesting because it has lots of different biological functions. So in its, its hormonal um, function relates to plant architecture. Um, so root hair, hair elongation, um, branching, etc. It also is a signal involved with um, a symbiotic relationships with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And it also is used as a germination stimulant for parasitic angiosperms, parasitic plants. And these are extremely um, problematic, particularly in nutrient poor soils in sub Saharan Africa and other places, uh, where a infection of these witch weeds and strikers can wipe out up to 80% of the crop. So they're very interesting um, molecules and relatively newly identified. And there are a lot of different industrial applications that they could be used for. So they can be used to modify crop architecture to improve yields and harvesting indexes. They could be used uh, to improve symbiotic associations, to improve nutrient uptake and increase resilience to drought. And they can also be used to increase wood production in, in tree species. And of course, used for suicidal germination of parasitic weeds by treating a field um, with stragalactones prior to sowing it with your, with your crop target. So I have a, a um, very collaborative research program with Christine Beveridge and Liz Gillam at UQ. So Christine was one of the people who originally identified the enzyme, uh, sorry, the, the hormone behaviour of this particular these particular compounds, and with Kirill Alexandrov in um, protein engineering at Queensland University of Technology. And there are a number of different areas that we're looking at um, with stragalactones, including um, basic structure and function behaviour, metabolic engineering, um, developing biosensors, and looking at cytochrome P450 uh, CPR interactions. So this is a stragalactone biosynthetic pathway. It's produced by the methyl residual phosphate pathway in the, in the plastid. It's a, it's a carotenoid derivative. Um, so the uh, universal precursor is, is produced through this carotenoid pathway and carlactone is that precursor and that carlactone is exported into the cytosol and at the endoplasmic reticulum where it's decorated by, uh, by P450 activities. Uh, there is a very uh, high level of chemical diversity, the 30 or 40 of this, these different compounds that have been identified, and there's a very poor understanding of structure function relationships. Um, and it's also very difficult to get a better understanding because these are hormones, so they're produced at very, very tiny levels, and they're, they're um, difficult to examine analytically because of their structural diversity. Um, so the first thing we did, of course, was reconstruct a pathway. We did this in yeast. So we added a carotenoid module and we're able to demonstrate production of the um, intermediate carotenoids. And we added a carlactone module to convert uh, all transmitted carotene through to the carlactone. And we're able to demonstrate a good production of carlactone. These look like really simple experiments, but it literally took years to get there because of the challenging nature of the analytical chemistry involved in these particular projects. 
Um, and of course, downstream is the next step to look at the B450 decorations. So this, as I mentioned already, this chemical diversity is a real challenge and that the, the minute amounts is, a, amounts is a real challenge. If we can produce enough of these using a metabolic engineering system, then we can use them for structure functional relationships. We can use them to um, examine chemical diversity further and we can use them to perhaps generate new chemical diversity and new compounds with different, um, different agricultural applications. Um, we started uh, by building biosensors for these after we reconstruct the pathway and um, uh, Be Rebecca Wood, who was working on this project, decided that she would build a classical um, yeast 2 hybrid transcriptional biosensor for stragalactone detection. Uh, and that involves taking the stragalactone perception machinery and engineering it into a yeast 2 hybrid, hybrid system, fairly straightforward with green fluorescent protein as a reporter. And it worked. But it wasn't very sensitive. And at the time, we were looking for more sensitive and direct ways that didn't involve all the steps between transcription and translation and, and readout. So we wanted a more d d direct mechanism using protein based sensors. So we started working with Kirill Alexandrov and Jason Whitfield, who had were developing at the time a number of paradigms for protein based biosensors. The one that they started with was a what's called a split split GFP biosensor where you have a receptor binding to a ligand and then you have a, a protein um, ensemble coming together and bringing together the components of the green fluorescent protein so that you get fluorescence. Um, the mechanism that we actually used was something called a circularly permuted biosensor. This is comodulin and you can see that there's a really massive conformational change that happens when that protein is bound to or not bound to its ligand. And this is the concept that was used to develop these, these um, particular biosensors. So green fluorescent protein is taken apart and your protein of interest is inserted. And when when the, the um, biosensor is working properly, you either get fluorescence as the protein comes together on ligand binding, depending on what the conformational change is in response, or drop in fluorescence as the protein is pulled apart. Uh, and again, you acquire a protein that has a, a conformational change for this particular activity. So it turned out that the um, stragalactone receptor from Petunia that we were working with does indeed have a reasonable conformation change. So you can see the unbound form here and the bound form here, and there's a reasonable conformation change there. And Rebecca was able to engineer um, a number of different insertion sites for, uh, for green fluorescent protein on this particular uh, receptor and she identified the best one here which is an insertion at G166. And uh, when she tested that, um, that domain insertion biosensor um, compared to the transcriptional biosensor, she got a hundred fold increase in sensitivity, which is really fantastic. So that makes it a lot more sensitive. And you do want a sensitive biosensor if you're looking for something that is at low, low um, uh, abundance in, in tissues. Uh, she was also interested in trying to determine if she could develop sensors that were based on different types of um, sensing systems, perception systems. So the Petunia ones, the ones she already had, and she wanted to look at the Striga reception to see if she could differentiate between Striga lactones that act as germinant st stimulants and Striga lactones that act as, as um, hormones. Because of course, there's this constant chemical warfare that's going on in terms of evolution that happens between the um, Striga, Striga plants, the witch reeds, and their, their target host organisms. So they're constantly developing this chemical diversity to try and get away from being identified by the by the the um, the witch weeds, uh, and also still ha maintain the the um, the branching and hormone activities of the the compounds that they're working with, and so she designed a second biosensor based on the parasite receptor. Um, that sensor retained specificity and she was able to identify the, the best insertion site. There's, this is loss of GFP activity here. So you can see this is the best one down here. And she got a nice sensitive response system and that it did indeed differentiate, the two different sensors did indeed differentiate between um, compounds that are known to behave as um, germination stimulants and ones that have different functions in, in hormone activity. So that's fantastic. Can someone give me a time check, please? How are we going for time? I know we started a bit late, but if we didn't start late, we'd be heading up towards full time now. You can proceed, uh, Claudia. Carry okay. on? Okay. All right. So, five minutes? Okay. So we then proceeded to, yes, the, the, the five more minutes of the talk left. <laughs> we then proceeded to look at the cytochrome P450 um, module. And we're interested in understanding better how cytochrome P450s 
decorate striga lactones, but also how they interact with their reduction partners. So Marcus and Marcus Hamburg Ring and uh, Liz Gillum uh, were collaborators on this particular project. So the first thing that he looked at was looking at ancestral sequence reconstruction. And ancestral sequence reconstruction is used to look back through the mists of time to try to identify um, uh, ancestral or more sometimes more generalist or even more specialist if you go further back, um, behaviour and enzymes. And he was looking at the um, the cytochrome P450s that catalyses carlactone to carlactonic acid um, reaction here. So he identified um, ancestral, used ancestral reconstructions to identify putative ancestors for a whole lot of different nodes in in the uh, evolutionary tree of, of uh, flowering plants and every one of them was actually functional in terms of its CO spectra so it was working functionally as a um, cytochrome P450 which is really exciting. This is in partnership with an Arabidopsis um, reductase uh, and these were yet to, to, um, to look a little bit further into them and see how they behave um, in the longer term. Um, but the next part of the project he was looking at was again looking at biosensors to try to look more closely at how the P450 and the reductase partner interacts together. He tried two different ones. Firstly, a circularly permutated one, and I've explained what they are pre the already. That actually didn't work very well. It wasn't very effective. And the next approach he used was using a FRET system, um, a Fourier resonance uh, electrotransfer transfer system. That system worked quite effectively and was able to engineer a system that had very nice FRET behaviour and gives us an idea of when the P450 is in close proximity with its reductase partner. And that's going to be a prerequisite for those two enzymes interacting. And what we hope to be able to do now is to, to generate combinatorial libraries between P450s and reductases to see where see which ones that they will interact with and then possibly use those to modify the chemical diversity of stragalactones that we're looking at. Um, I won't take the time to explain this project um, because it's a, it's a side story and really just a this is what we're doing now in the future but if anybody wants to ask me about um, using virus-like particles as bespoke um, quasi subcellular reaction environments and, and how we can use those to understand enzyme behavior in crowd environments then you can ask me offline later. So I'll end on that note um, and say firstly thank you to all the people who actually do the work. This is the, the team uh, over at University of Queensland um, and of course to our funding agencies, the Queensland Government, the Australian Government, HFSB, um, European Commission and, and CSIRO and our various industry partners and of course our collaborators on the project. And thank you very much for your time and I'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Claudia. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Claudia, for a wonderful talk. Uh, so, a, any question answer from audience? If not, I, I want to ask one question. So, when you are looking for this uh, protein biosensor, is there a half life is also involved? Like we have to consider the half life of the protein. The half life of the protein. Mm -hmm. Yes, always. So, the sensors that that we've worked with. Um, we, we've been doing them mostly ex vivo, so you just mix the, the ligand with the sensor. We can do it in vivo as well. Um, in vivo, it's going to be a lot more uh, labile, um, but the ones that we've put in vivo so far have been quite quite stable. Uh, it's certainly possible that we would run into a protein which the cell identifies as dangerous and as tagged for degradation. That would be problematic. Okay, great. Uh, there is one question uh, from the audience that uh, six gram of neurolidol was produced in yeast or in the E. coli? Yeast. Yeast in the yeast. Okay. Yeah. So. E. coli is not very good at um, making, well, it's not as good as yeast as at making isoprenoids um, mm -hmm. and especially the C10 compounds it's not, not, not so good at. Great. Sorry, it was a wonderful talk. I have a question. Yesterday, I uh, we had the same discussion with uh, Ajay Kumar from Manas. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he said uh, both the systems are like really good. It depends on the target metabolite. So, uh, what's your opinion, please? So it depends on what was the. 
Well, he said it depends on the metabolite. They were the target metabolites. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the class, the family of metabolites that you're working with. So um, for the so you you say that uh, yeast is the best model. Oh, it depends. Depends on the class of terpenoid that you're functioning. In our hands, yeast is always delivered better. Um, the C10s are always challenging. All the tools that we have developed are in yeast. We haven't really tried very hard in E. coli because our early experiments weren't very <laughs> rewarding in E. coli. Um, okay. So I don't know, you could, you could probably um, develop similar tools in, in E. coli, but the reality is, I mean, with E. coli, the native pathway flux is very low. Um, yeast has a much higher pathway flux for terpenoids because it uses, it, it just produces a lot more. I mean, it's making gosterols for its cell membrane, whereas E. coli is making phenones and a, and a few other things. Okay. Yeah, I think, Claudia, there's an, another question that generally what is the most rate limiting step in the pathway deconstruction in yeast? There is from the audience, this is the question. Generally, what's the most rate limiting step? Um, well, it's really rate limiting if you massively overexpress a mevalonate pathway in yeast or, or a mevalonate pathway in E. coli and allow prenophosphates to accumulate because the whole system shuts down then. So it's, the first step is always to put in a strong sink before you upregulate in the upstream pathway. Um, balance, a lot of people talk about rate limiting steps, but it's really more about balancing metabolism. And balancing metabolism, not just in cofactors and reducing equivalence, but in accumulation of compounds in the pathway. So it's not unusual, especially for um, foreign compounds, but also for native compounds. If they accumulate at, at high levels, then, then you have negative feedback or you have toxicity effects. And we've seen that definitely in the prenyl phosphates. So the key thing is actually tweaking throughout the pathway at the same time, um, at various times and combinatorially developing your pathway um, and identifying and resolving bottlenecks as you go along. So it's really important to have good metabolomics capability and use that hand in glove with your engineering. Okay. Yeah, so there's a last question. Uh, is how is trigolactones improve uh, crop architecture? Improve crop architecture? Well, we don't know yet because you don't have enough to be able to do the experiments to determine um, how effectively we can change uh, branching architecture. Um, and, and whether it can be used as, a, as an outcome to improve yield index. Um, what we can say is that stregolactone mutants often have changed architecture um, and sometimes dwarfing and increased fruit set, etc., that, that might be useful for, for improving the yield index. And we also expect that they will improve secondary wood production in, in, in um, tree plants, etc. So really, we these are, these are theoretical agricultural applications most of the time. And when we get to the stage, and we, we actually have now a strain that can, be, can make enough carlactone can then be modified to more active stragalactones to test these um, to test these series. Great. So there is no more questions. And thank you very much, Claudia, for this wonderful and enriching talk. It's a really a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia, for taking your time out and uh, giving a talk. Thank you for having me. Dr. Vivek has joined. So good afternoon. Dr. Yeah. Vivek, uh, could you take over the session as co-chair and uh, I think next speaker is uh, Devabrata. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Devabrata, we are not see, uh, able to see your video. Yeah, that, that is the here everything. Can you just uh, disconnect and recall me? I think there's a set of problem here. Do, or, or we can do one thing. You can share your slides. So yeah, can, yes, yes. Yeah. You can leave and rejoin if you if it is possible. Uh, I, I tried that leaving and rejoining, but again, somehow camera is not giving an access. I don't know why it's happening. We can see so the see, slides. Your slides. Maybe I think you have to present without your video. <laughs> Sorry okay. about it. Oh, fine. So first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dinesh and. Um, Dr. Prabhu Trivedi and the whole organizing team for giving me this opportunity to present my work. For the last few days, uh, I am listening a lot of wonder wonderful talks. So this talk is a little bit different. Here, some part of science and some part of electronic engineering. 
so we are in indian institute of technology roorkee and we are working on the metabolomics in one hand and on the other hand we are working on developing electronic sensors sorry to sensors. interrupt you uh, dr devagrutta yeah. uh, yes yes dr vivek are you there sir i am there i am there yeah could you please introduce uh, the speaker uh, yeah it's uh, yeah. sure sir yes. vivek can you turn yeah, on yeah. video yeah please clear sir yeah 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 sir it is my pleasure to introduce uh, dr devrata sarkar presently an associate professor of iit rurki so i have this much of information with me right now so without taking much of your time i request uh, dr professor yeah. uh, devrata yes. sarkar please to take over the session sir please yeah. thank you yeah. yeah thank you so much for the introduction so now i'll continue with my slides so coming into the that the first th question is that uh, why natural products are attractive target for the drug discovery especially the plant natural product so first thing this natural products with decades they evolved to be bioactive so with time we are getting natural products with new bioactivities secondly their structures are not limited to the chemist imagination there is a lot of diversity in the structure that is naturally produced by the plants second third thing that our ethno medicine or ethno botany will guide us what is the maybe the most suitable plant to be used for curing the different uh, upcoming diseases and so fourth one this plant natural product has bilateral promise either natural product itself can act as a drug or it can act as a precursor for the semi synthetic development of the new molecule now looking into the data this is not very encouraging so far the plant natural product is concerned although there is 2 lakh 50000 reported plant species with greater biodiversity but when we are looking into the commercialization of plant natural product as a drug so this is just 5% we are here but if you look into the synthetic drug molecule this is 20 33% and then if it is a natural product derivative this is the second largest class so this this data is a bit discouraging for the use of plant natural products as a drug candidate so now that's why we want to ask why this poor utilization of such a wide diversity of plant natural products and then we found how this first that how this plant natural products are used there is one traditional use that you take the extract of the plant material and use the whole extract that is the concept of lot of ayurvedic medicine and lot of herbal drugs and for concerning their efficacy there is no doubt they are working wonderful second approach is instead of instead of using the crude extract you isolate some pure compound test its drug properties and make it a commercial true drug like there are two approaches now while doing both the approaches there is a strong problem when you are doing the first approach farmers will bring lot of lot of plant material but once we isolate the pure compound yield becomes very low so that's the result the frustration because the cost will go up very high and that will get some give some disadvantage of utilization of this drug second approach when you are using a crude extract or the plant extract as a drug the problem is the quality control sometimes plant may have high natural products of the target origin or they may have may have low or they don't have any uh, such metabolite so and this is really if target bioactive metabolites are there it will give a wonderful effect if target metabolites are not there it won't give an effect so that is the reason sometimes herbal drugs work so with few patients sometimes somebody will tell you it's not working and now our research group is trying to address both the issues so first this quality control is a major issue and we would like to find some of the technology which can quickly find out this quality control issues so one of the best way to make the quality control that lot of pharmaceutical companies are doing lot of laboratories are doing to check the quality by means of spectrophotometric or chromatographic like hptlc hplc or ms technology 
all fluorescent based technology these are wonderful technology accuracy is quite good but problem is with this technology with a small number of sample this is very easy to do this we one can do it into the laboratory one can check the quality but as soon as the sample number is very large so then one alternative that we could take our instrument to the garden and check but unfortunately this is not possible and that is the reason most of the pharma companies or industries what they are doing a batch testing out of a mass of the plant they are testing few of the samples and based on that they are making their products now we are trying to identify can it be smart that means instead of carrying all this gc hplc or sophisticated instrument a simple layman a farmer will go with your android phone into the plant and it will just click in top of the plant and it will tell oh i am this amount of metabolite is there so with this hypothesis we started our research four years back now i will present where we are now so i will present this into two part first we developed a smart cell technology to produce therapeutically important natural products in in metabolically engineered plant cell culture and second part will i will talk about the we developed a non invasive sensor to detect the bioactive metabolites and how this sensor works now coming into the first part we have targeted vidania shominifera which is a very important medicinal plant which finds uh, an array of uses in different curing different elements and here our target is vidaferin a which is biologically well characterized and there is excellent market demand for this molecule and we thought of is there any way to enhance their hmm, and the amount of vidaferin a in in vitro conditions because the always when the farmers are taking the leaves of the plant or roots of the plant it causes a destructive harvesting so in one way that requires lot of soil lot of lands to cultivate the plant otherwise lot of other biomasses are wasted the or the carbon biomass is wasted because of making chlorophyll lignin and other carbon based metabolites so what we thought can it be possible to develop this vidaferin by a cell culture so we started to develop the callus culture of this vidania somnifera and with dicamba we got excellent friable callus of this plant material and then what we did we convert this callus into a viable cell culture so this is a fantastically growing friable cell culture and then we tested the vidaferin amount we developed an hplc method which can separate vidaferin and other related vidanolites and with this method we found that leaves are somehow producing around 8 to 9 micrograms of vidaferin a callus is little bit less and whenever we are making a cell culture because of the homogeneity and high growth rate their amount is higher than the callus but they are not more than the amount of the leaves that we are getting and then we thought can we make an engineered callus or engineered cell line so that was with that goal we thought we'll engineer the biosynthetic pathway of this vidaferin biosynthesis so looking into the vidaferin biosynthesis it start with isopentanyl pyrophosphate and then it goes through giranyl pyrophosphate and finally it gives the 24 methylene cholesterol this is supposed to be the biosynthetic precursor of different vidanolites including vidaferin a so we targeted this vidania shominifera sqs gene the squalene synthase gene and we over express into the cell culture so <clears throat> that was our strategy we first develop a callus and then in callus we over express this uh, is this sqs gene and there is an also the yfp fusion eyfp was there so we used pr ligate 104 gateway vector and then we what we found and transgenic cell line and this is cisgenic cell line we found the low expression of sqs that is comes from the endogenous plant sqs but in the all the cell culture lines we have received a higher amount of expression level of sqs which proves the extra copy of the plant inserted as well as in wild type of plant yfp was found missing that also shows the the positiveness of the 
cisgenic cell line. Now we tested the vidaferrin level into the this cisgenic cell line, and what we found that this cisgenic cell line they are produced almost two-fold higher level of vidaferrin A compared to the leaf. And now for the another advantage of this cell line, the production time for this vidaferrin A by the cell culture is just 16 days. So from the day of subculture, the 16 day cell culture attains the log phase and it accumulates a lot of vidaferrin A. So that would be a fantastic industrial platform, this cisgenic cell line to produce enhanced level of vidaferrin. And again, the extraction from the cell cultures are always easier than the plants because of lacking the lignins, all the chlorophylls and other materials. So the extraction cost will be also lower. So currently we are trying to put more and more genes into the pathway. We are also trying to make a double contract with SQS and SQE. So not only to see the enhancement of the vidaferrin A, but also how this pathway flux working, what is the role of each transgene. So till now we have this uh, eight, we have generated 18 cisgenic cell line and more or less the average production is almost two times higher than the control plant leaves. Now coming into the second part that the quality control. So as we discussed in the beginning, the quality of the vidaferrin into the plant is very important factor because before harvesting. So that will determine the, what is the quality of the raw material or what is the right time to harvest. For that, first we what we have done, we have selected this plant from different parts of India. So four parts mainly from Uttarakhand that is uh, nearby to our institution, then Himachal Pradesh, then West Bengal and one from the Jharkhand. So we have grown all the plants in our greenhouse and what we found that we developed an HKTLC method for the quick uh, quantification and the separation of Vidaferrin A. So that is also published in Journal of Chromatography B. And what we found that a different plant collected from different uh, geographical location of the India has different amount of vidaferrin A content. That means there is a variation and we are going right into the track that different plant at different age or different geographical location, this vidaferrin A content is variable. Then what next? We have taken two commercial products manufactured by two reputed companies, so that names is undisclosed, and we checked the metabolite, the vidaferrin content, and we found so this F1 to F20, these are the batch number, and in each and every batch, you can see there's a huge variation of this vidaferrin A content. So this is not because companies have a perfect R&D for the quality assurance, so that we. We, what we suppose that this variation comes because of the variation in the starting raw material. This plant leaves or the roots has the different amount of vidaferrin. So that's why that is carry forwarded when they are making the this plant extract. So that was very encouraging result for us to move us forward. And then we thought of developing a one single sensor that will can work from the medicinal farm garden during transport to the manufacturer. So that means for that, we were looking for a remote data transmission and the artificial intelligence. And with this aim, what we did, we developed a smart sensor. So how this sensor works? So most of the medicinal plant has aromatic characteristic due to the presence of certain volatile organic compounds. So these volatile organic compounds emits from the plants because they are boiling points are quite less and within these volatile compounds some volatile compounds are known as the signature or the marker volatile what this means by signature that means their quantity varies in proportion to the sum of the target metabolite so and then we thought if we can identify a signature volatile then we developed a semiconductor, metal oxide semiconductor, which reacts with this particular volatile metabolite and gives a change into the resistance. And then our goal is solved. So the moment we get a change into the resistance, so that is 
process utilizing a circuit and that is utilized for the sensor. I will show you into the detail. So this is the concept. So like methaferrin A is a non-volatile, but some of the precursor of this metabolite acts as a volatile. And if we measure their flux by the SPMEGCMS volatilomics, and what we found, there are three volatiles whose flux is equal to the flux of the methaferrin A. That means if you can quantify the volatile, you can indirectly quantify the non-volatile target metabolite. So this is principles of the fluxomics balance. So this is the whole idea. The plants will omit certain signature volatiles, will put the sensor below this volatile, sensor will catch the volatile and as soon as amount of volatile will determine the amount of signal or amount of the current flowing. So we started with the Vidania Sominifera plant. We make a different variations, different for the age, different uh, geographical location. And we first analyze the volatile profile by using the SPMEGCMS technology. And once we identified this volatile, we developed a transducer. Volatile react with the transducer and it then transmits the signal which is processed by an Android phone. This is the detail, I'm not going into the detail, but idea is now you can see this, if suppose the red one is the signature volatile, it will first react with a transducer and then there is the voltage change. This voltage change we are processing with a low cost processor and then this is data is transmitted through the wireless system and then remotely one can see the data as well as take the output and process the data. Names of these volatiles. We named it uh, R16, R21, and R31. So these three volatiles exactly show the proportional increase or decrease for through as per the quantity of the with the ferrin A. Look at into the this slide. So this happens. So these three volatile metabolites. So they will show increasing pattern as as and when this with the ferrin A is increasing. And similarly, if with the ferrin A is less, so this signature metabolite is less. And then our job was to catch all these three signature metabolite. Since we have three target metabolites, so that's why we made and transducers of three metal oxides. We have here zinc oxide, titanium oxides, and the silicon oxide. And that's why we call it a hybrid transducer. So single transducer can react with three specific volatile metabolites and gives a combined response. So this is the principle, this is the sensor molecule, there's a small heater is there to give and warm up to the metal oxide and as soon as volatile react with this sensor, it creates an electron depletion zone and as a result, this load resistance will change and it will flow the, it will flow the more and more, more and more current. So this is our sensor prototype. You can see this is a small device. I will show in the next slide and video. And then on the top of this device, the center one is basically is our sensor that, that contains this hybrid metal oxide. And these four lasers are there. So why this laser is important? Normally, the volatile emission is not is very less from the Vidania leaves. So this is what this laser will do. So laser will do an in, in a milliseconds, one heat into the leaf and this, meta, this volatile metabolites will come out and that will be detected by this sensor. So I will go into a video so now you can see how this. So this is a sensor that is working into the field. So what you have to do, first you make it into the reading level. It's very simple to use. Just hold the plant on the top of this nose and click. So it's showing with the fading high.
So this is a and this is how it works. So this is a device. So one can see the output into the sensors uh, display itself or one can process this remotely. This is Wi-Fi and AI enabled. So one can also process and visualize the data irrespective of the distance utilizing the common Android phones. We have WS uh, smart app that is that you have to load into the phone and then you can access the data. For the farmer use, we have not given the actual value that is used for the scientist. We have we have made a separate uh, sensor where you can see the exact amount of the with the ferry. But for the common farmers, we just put uh, high, moderate and the low. High means when the amount of with the ferry content is more than 10 microgram per, per uh, fresh weight and low means when it is less than 5 micrograms. Something in between will be will considered as a moderate and that is good for the farmer that one way they can know what is the right stage for the harvest they, and at the same time if someone has an elite cultivar they can ask for the more retail value or the more sell value for this product. So one hand it will help into the quality control of the plant material. On the other hand, this will help for getting the correct revenue for the growers. Now the question is how much accurate is this sensor? So we have tested till now on 200 different with any so many feather plant under different geographical condition, different season. So here you can see this is the, the blue one is the biochemical that we determine the with the ferrin content by means of HPLC and red one is the by detected by means of the sensor. So we are still now we are quite close. This is even 80 to 90 percent accuracy we are getting and now coming into the cost of this sensor. So this cost of this sensor is less than 1000 rupees. It's just 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 nothing to anybody, any farmer. And that is our main goal that it should go to the wider and wider range of the farmer community as well as the industry. Of course, we are not claiming that it is a replacement for the HPLC or the chromatography techniques, but it will be an add-on. So because for large number of samples, this is not possible to process by a sophisticated instrument. And if it is a process, then always it involves a cost. So this is the first line of evidence to check. And if there is any error, one can check those samples into the sophisticated instrument. So as a conclusion slide, so what we can say that herbal products have huge market potential in India as well as worldwide. They are the quite safe drugs, but quality assurance is a crucial factor for the success of this herbal product and where this low cost sensor will play a very significant role. Secondly, this is smart cell technology will be a good add on to mimic the production utilizing the in vitro cell culture and there we can save a lot of plants, a lot of plant biomass and quickly we can produce the targeted metabolites. So far this technology both sensor and this smart cell approach we applied to with the ferrin A but currently our research group is targeted to different other metabolites and we are hopeful in future to come up with such and such low cost norming the sensor technology. So this is my research group so that is working at IIT Roorkee. So she is Varsha Tomar. She is working in the this Vidanya cell culture part, metabolomics part. This is Dr. Shashank Shagar Saini, a postdoc who is working into the sensor part. And he is Arun Kumar who is looking into the artificial intelligence part. So with this note, I am ending my presentations. And if you have any questions, so I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah, please. So yeah, yeah. thank you, Th thank you, uh, Professor Devrata. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, indeed, it is a pleasure uh, in listening to your talk, and also it is a very innovative and also a need of the work for developing a portable system. And in fact, it is a non-destructive method of uh, uh, identifying uh, with a ferrin A system there. And uh, there are some couple of questions in Q and A section. There is the first question yes. which I will read out uh, from uh, Professor P K Singh. As the first yes. question is: uh, Is it possible to get with the ferrin A secreted in a culture medium? 
till and till now we are not getting into the culture medium we are, we are getting a small amount into the culture medium but most of the things we are uh, getting inside the cell so what we are getting we have to harvest the cells and then we have to take out the with the feeding okay. so another question is sir have you looked into the effect of other vitanolites and other vitanolite accumulation in vitania cell line uh yes we we are working on it we we have calculated other vitanolites like vitanolite d particularly they, this is also increasing with the um, this is in cisgenic cell lines but so far we are mostly focused on this with the ferrin a because that was the mandate for the funding agency who has provided this project but of course other other metabolites are also increasing and we are in a process of looking into the all other vitanolites and also we are also looking into the making systemic for the different gene combinations so one more question is uh, oh, which is the volatile voc in uh, ashwagandha uh, yeah actually this volatile part we are in a process of patenting so that is still undisclosed so maybe come as soon as patent comes we will come up with this volatile information okay so one more question since vitania somnifera root is most of the part, most used part of the plant have you tried mm -hmm. correlate the detection of voc in relation to the maturation of the root uh yeah that is our next target that we we'll look into the like is there any correlation with uh, voc emission in the root maturity or the root specific vitanolite so that is our target so we have some basic leads that there are certain volatiles which show some correlation with the roots but problem with the root specific volatiles that the roots going inside the soil and the soil microbes also emit some volatiles so that is interfering so currently we are uh, trying to solve this issue that is to identify a very critical uh, signature metabolite which is completely different from the all other atmospheric sources and then maybe in future we can come up with such technology that uh, we will measure the volatiles from the aerial part and we will make a correlate biosynthetic correlation and then we can track the vitanolites into the roots and uh, similar to the same question so another one is uh, if other volatiles voc is mixed with vitania then how to differentiate the voc is from vitania yeah so so so, so this voc is so, so VOCs are always like a mixture. So here, here the main part is the semiconductor. So these semiconductors are designed in such a way that they are specific to a particular volatile. So if they will react with the other volatile, there will be a signal change. But the, with that signal change, we can say whether it is a specific volatile or it is a non-specific volatile. Then we applied an artificial intelligence so that 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 gives the sensor or, or this transducer. So it can recognize the self or non-self. So, for example, there are ten volatiles. The signature will give and difference of five milliohms, and the other volatiles can give and difference of the two one milliohms, zero point one milliohms. So as soon as the difference is less than five, the sensor will itself categorize that this is not the volatile we are looking for, and it will off switch the target. So, for example, if you take the sensor and keep it to any other plant, I'm giving example like any other any other medicinal plant, plumber or jalinic example, it will immediately say tell that this is not with any so many fera or the or the target is absent. So this is uh, that that is or uh, that is the heart of this technology to first identify the volatile and to develop a corresponding transducer. So this match is like a lock and key. So if a, a transducer is a lock and volatile is a key. So that is the specificity of this device. So most of the questions towards VOC, and one more is uh, what is about uh, VOC of wild and cultivated species? Is there any difference that you can observe it something else like similar to that? Uh, so sorry, can you please repeat the question? What about the VOC of wild and cultivated species of Vitania? Wild. So, so so far that, that that is the validation currently validation part is going on. So so far we tested uh, 200 species that is located from different part. But now we are increasing this validation part that if it uh, if some wild land growing plant is there, if there is any difference into the volatile composition. But that is of, of course and only calibration issue. So that we can sort it out. So based on the difference we can train the sensor.
and the last one is uh, what is the estimated cost difference between obtaining with an ea with a fering ea from engineered cell culture and from those obtained from the farm grown plants how oh, that, that is actually very very good question so so uh, that is as to be honest we have not calculated this uh, but of course in initial investment is more to develop the stable cell lines after this uh, genetic transformation but once this cell line is ready i, I think the cost will be less but to be honest uh, at this moment we don't have a, a exact idea about the cost uh, differences so with this i have my personal question some of those uh, regarding yeah. so that the system has been standardized for vitaferin a is it yeah, uh, yeah so how does uh, it can recognize for uh, with an allied a in the root system because that is the roots has been the economical part from the farmers per se so no so, so so root for root system currently with the, this sensor will work only for the leaf system because with the serine a is mostly concentrated into the leaves and now we are looking for for the roots we are making a micro injection based sensor so yeah. so that means the micro needle will go below the soil and then it will take a root specific volatile mm -hmm. so that thing we are working for this as well as for the jata mansi there is a plant which has mm -hmm. the same problem there's yeah. the root specific otherwise it has been uh, so far it has been only the destructive method of uh, estimation so yes yes it is uh, valid and uh, the most important thing is uh, it is less than 1000 rupees or around yeah, less, even less than 1000 rupees that that we are costing if some company will make i am sure it will be less than 300 rupees and what would be the limit of detection sir lod Uh, for with a free ye this this can this can detect 0.5 microgram is there that such low amount is there like volatile it can detect 0.1 ppm that corresponds to around 0.1 to 0.5 microgram so that is quite low level it can detect certainly thank you sir thank you it is indeed it is a pleasure in listening to you and thank also thank you so much sir dr dinesh and the whole organizing committee it's a wonderful experience to present to you thank you thank sir. you sir thank you thank you sir thank you so may I request uh, dr devrata to introduce next speaker uh, so next speaker is uh, ms nivedita yeah nivedita yes yeah one second yeah, can, so, I can i can i uh, nivedita yeah. is available the second author of the tough stack uh, her name is kalyani is presenting mm -hmm. so you can you can you can introduce this kalyani okay so the, 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 so the title is a development of indigenous yeast expression platform for the production of high value triterpene so this so kalyani is presenting on behalf of ms nivedita and she is from csr shimap so kalyani please i welcome you in this presentation and please start your presentation um, thank you dr sarkar uh, am i audible yeah yes you are audible yes um so hello uh, good afternoon i'm kalyani and i'll be presenting in place of my senior ms nanda the title of our project is the development of indigenous yeast expression platform for the production of high value triterpenes colin um this is a ongoing project conducted under the supervision of dr dk venkatrao in csir seema uh, bangalore um so squalene is a naturally occurring 30 carbon triterpenoid that was found in both plants and animals it was initially sourced from uh, shark liver oil till the intense fishing left the species at risk of extinction the terpenoid is known for its use for oil and water emulsion vaccines in pharma industry with great potential uses in cosmetics uh, perfume and personal use industries with the high demand of the compound alternative approaches are in need to meet the market requirement unfortunately the rate of natural production of the metabolite is not commercially viable yield our idea of a, a alternate source was to develop a yeast expression platform so saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, with its grass status is an ideal uh, squalene production platform so it has well characterized uh, expression pathways and chemical interactions and is established for uh, genetic and uh, metabolic engineering as a cherry on top it has the uh, key intermediates like squalene endogenously produced in its uh, pathway for uh, sterol biosynthesis 
towards the right side here you can we can see the um, uh, basic pathway of sterols in this uh, production in yeast and i have just highlighted the um, genes uh, that encode for the enzymes that we will be um, focusing on through the course of this study um, so the objectives of the study was first to create um, expression cassettes with the selected genes and um, then uh, to create uh, to transform the cassettes into yeast strain sen 1d and check this squalene expression with respect to the overexpressed genes the cassettes we created are two micron plasmids with uh, galactose inducible bidirectional promoter with different oxotrophic selections towards the right uh, we are showing the design of the cassettes um uh, there are we designed three cassettes with two genes each so um these cassettes uh, um so going forward we hope to scale up uh, to fermentation for the better concentration of squalene so uh, going to results done so far um first cassette construction would have would was Uh, DHMG one, uh, UPC two one with GAL one and ten promoters. The DHMG one is a truncated form of HMG one, and to the right side we can see the um, where the gene comes in the pathway of um, the um, squalene synthesis. And uh, the truncation uh, here, it's a rate limiting um, enzyme, and um, HMG coa reductase, which is uh, which. HMG1 codes for HMG coa reductase, and that converts HMG coa to mevalonate. The truncation of uh, DHMG was the removal of the N-terminal feedback functionality of the enzyme, resulting in upregulation of mevalonate production. The second gene here is UPC21, which is a point mutant of UPC2 gene. UPC2 is a global transcription factor regulating the biosynthesis of uh, uh, sterol uh, of sterol uh, sterol synthesis and upc21 has been reported to constitutively activate the sterol pathway as a whole now going to the figures we are illustrating the process of cassette construction so we amplify the genes with primers containing um, selected restriction sites from the uh, multiple cloning sites of the um, um, plasmid that we wish to insert the genes into and the dhmg is isolated from a laboratory strain genome and upc21 was isolated from a plasmid that was gifted to us by jasper rain group of uc berkeley the amplicons were inserted into the plasmid by restriction digestion and ligation the plasmid that was obtained from this process was isolated and finally verified by insert release where the plasmid was digested with all four restriction enzymes that were used in the creation of the gasset the insert release were compared to the control bands um, of the amplified genes that is seen in the second gel image where the first lane uh, is the control thmg1 gene the third lane is the sorry um, the third lane is the control upc21 gene and the second lane has the um, uh, digested plasmid with uh, bands correlating to thmg1 and upc21 this verified plasmid was then um, inserted into the um, into the yeast strain the second cassette was the um, cassette containing erg8 and uh, erg19 the enzyme um, so these enzymes uh, form steps that are between the mevalonate and isopentyl phosphate intermediates uh, about midway in the pathway from acetyl coa to squalene again the construction process is the same here with uracil used as a selection marker in the plasmid the third cassette was uh, created with uh, isopentyl diphosphate isomerase and erg20 these are from the final steps before the conversion to squalene erg20 catalyzes conversion of geranyl uh, pyrophosphate to farnesyl pyrophosphate fpp which is a pivotal intermediate in production of many terpenoids it's uh, to be noted that um, the plasmids are uh, uh, introduced into a wild type with the functioning sterols in this pathway 
um, which produce native levels of this compound. Next, the uh, next we quantify the expression of scoline in the uh, strains transformed with the cassettes. The quantification was done by GCFID. We create four mutant strains, three uh, with one of the constructed plasmid each, and fourth a double mutant with uh, two plasmids, ERG 890 C21 PHMG cassettes. The control strain was a wild type strain of CEN1D with an empty plasmid inserted. Uh, the strains were grown for 10 days and uh, 250 OD of the cell pellet is taken at 120 and 240 hours. And um, the extraction of, of scoline was uh, done by alkaline KOH method. Um, below shown is the graph uh, uh, graphs for the scoline production. The graph shown is for 128 hours and uh, here right off the bat you can see an explosive increase in scoline production in the THMG UPC21 mutant that is the pink bar graph and uh, followed by a greater increase in the double mutant which is THMG UPC ERG8 ERG19. Um, you can see the same increase in the um, um, peaks found in the detector response of the FID uh, um, graph. So cholesterol was used as an internal standard and um, ERG is the ergosterol, which is the final product of the pathway that we focus on. Though there were slight variations in ERG, uh, it was insignificant compared to the uh, uh, greater increase in the squalene uh, synthesis for the uh, THMG UPC mutant and the double mutant. Uh, the this is the 240R um, result uh, of the same culture. Here we see THMG UPC2 has a uh, increase in production, whereas the double mutant uh, product, though still high, is low compared to the 120 hour mark. This may possibly be due to some feedback inhibition. So. Um, in conclusion, uh, we are currently at a point where we can confidently say that we have achieved 130 to 160 fold increase in squalene accumulation in two of the uh, lab developed strains. The control strain um, uh, quantity at 240 hours was uh, calculated to be 1.37 plus or minus 0.8 microgram per ml of squalene. And uh, below given are, uh, in the table are the values for um, values calculated for 120 hours and 240 hours for the double mutant and the THMG UPC21 mutant. Additional plasmids with different oxytrophic uh, selections uh, are being constructed via Golden Gate assembly for more comprehensive uh, study of the expression. Going forward, we expect to get more and better results from this project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kalani. So, I don't see any questions in this uh, Q&A section. So, if there are no questions, uh, I will only ask few questions there. So, is that a double mutant what you have shown there? It is a 120 and the milligrams of squalene. Uh, and then difference is only, is it so significant? Slide number 8. Um, uh, one minute, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which slide are you talking about, sir? Slide number eight. Okay. So double double mutant is only it is uh, approximately one twenty, and then this is another hundred. Is it so? Um, how do you say that one hundred one twenty hours? Um, sir, I do not understand the question. Can you repeat that? So this is one is uh, that the red color one is it hundred micrograms? 100 mg, right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and the it's uh, yeah. 84 uh, and 100 so at 120 hours. Then how do you downstream this actually? Is it the downstreaming steps has been stabilized? Um, no, sir. This is uh, basically um, um, we've just upregulated these uh, enzymes. And uh, the in, uh, like we've just induced the upregulation of the enzymes. We have 
not designed any uh, downstream steps as of now. Uh, what about the carbon flux actually? How much percentage of carbon is needed at the initial stage? Um, I am uh, not sure sir, it was done by Vijay Dutta sir. Maybe Venkat can answer. I think we need to work out on this. Okay. So, if there are no questions, then... Uh, uh, Kalyani, I, I have one question. Uh, have you estimated the extraction cost? Like, if you are producing squalene using your risk system, so any cost calculation has been done? Um, not as of yet, sir. But that is a, uh, that's actually a very important step. We, we will uh, do that um, as soon as possible. Yeah, they, uh, otherwise a very good, wonderful system because squalene is economically important and the system is producing quite... Uh, promising enhancement. Great. So, if uh, there is no more questions, so I, I express thanks to Kalyani. It's a wonderful presentation. And uh, now we'll, I will invite to the, our next speaker. Thank you, Kalyani. Thank you. So, our uh, next speaker is Mr. Dhanush. Uh, yes, sir. So, Mr. Yes, sir can I share my desktop, sir? Yeah, you can so share your desktop. Me, sir. Yes. Please share your desktop. Please share your slide. So, Dhanus is from CF, CSIS CFTRI and he will present on transgenic expression of Bugulocytes uh, Arabinensis Delta 6 desaturate gene for production of steradonic acid. Uh, so, sir, can you see my screen, sir? No. Uh, not now, not now, I can't see. Ah. Just to press this uh, up arrow and uh, share your desktop and PowerPoint, I think. Yeah, I think. Uh, no. Uh, Danush. Yes, sir. You just put your PowerPoint presentation mode, like presentation mode. Danush, can you hear us? Danush? Uh, Danush, can you hear us? Danush, I think your uh, mic is off. Danush, can you hear us? Danush? I think some issues with this MS team. I think uh, something uh, issue with it, maybe internet with Danush because he can't also hear us. Internet is fine here, yeah. also only thing you think. Yes, I think he's sharing now. Yes, now he's sharing.
Dhanush is telling he is facing some problem in sharing the screen. Venkatar Pradesh can help him actually. Yeah. Dhanush. Dhanush. Have his phone number. You can call him just once. We are trying to reach him. Should I call him through internal call or something? Danush, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I can hear you. We just message from this, you can see. But sharing the screen is not working, is messaging. When could he just? Yeah, but so he has to minimize the MS Teams window. Then open his presentation, put it in presentation mode. Hello, uh, Danush. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you do one thing. You open your presentation. Yes, put it in a presentation. Okay. okay? Yes, sir. Okay, then use Alt tab. Come back to MS Teams. Yes, sir. Okay, now you share. Share desktop. Uh, sir, can you see my screen now? One second, one second. Have you shared? Yes, sir. No, it is. No. The top arrow is there with the small window on top arrow. Share, share option is there. There you have to click. Then you can select the desktop. Sir, it's uh, not coming, sir. No. Uh, your PPT is on or it is in a presentation mode? My PPT is, my PPT is on, sir. Okay. You, you press down Alt and use Tab to come back MS Teams. You don't close the presentation. Use okay, sir. Press down uh, Alt and use Tab to come, come back to MS Teams. It's not working, sir. There you can share. Sir, uh, is it visible now? You shared it right last time. The same way I'm linking up to do it. Uh, sir, is it visible now? No, no, no. It is not visible. Uh, sir, can I present it next? I'll check it once and I will do it again. This presentation is not available. I think you are the last one. Uh, sir, is my screen visible now? Yeah. Is it visible now? Sir, now? Yeah. Uh, okay, sir.
Sir, is the screen visible, sir? No. Venkat. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Hello. yeah, yeah. Then, ah, then, yeah. Sir, sir, shall I proceed, sir? Yeah, please, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Danush. I'll be uh, talking. I'll be speaking about our uh, findings on uh, transient expression of. Uh, yes, sir. Turn on your video. Uh, yes, yeah, I'll try, sir. I'll try, sir. Video. Yes, sir. No, it's okay. You can present no issues. Uh, it's not coming, sir. That's why. Okay, okay. okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I'll be presenting our research findings on transgenic expression of Bacillus avensis, uh, Delta 6 desaturated gene for production of steroidic acid. Uh, omega 3 fatty acids are uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, so, which are of two types short chain and long chain. The short chain includes alpha linolenic acid and steroidic acid, and the long chain includes eicosapentaenoic and DHA. Uh, these have uh, pivotal role in our diet and uh, physiology. They help in preventing uh, heart disease and cancer, and they reduce inflammation. They protect us from metabolic disorders and help in brain and retinal development. The current sources are uh, fish oils and ma marine algae, but uh, they have shortcomings or limitations. Uh, that is, they have non-vegan source sustainability of fish supplies and due to con contamination of marine environment. We have to find certain, uh, we have to find alternative sustainable plant-based sources. And most of the plants produce ALA as their final uh, omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, our objective is functional characterization of genes involved in the synthesis of STRH triacylglycerol in Bacillus avensis and the genetic transformation and uh, transgenic expression of Bacillus avensis D60 in uh, linseed. Uh, why is it better to consume SDA than ALA? Uh, when we uh, consume ALA, it is converted to SDA with the help of enzyme D60, but in humans, it is a rate limiting step. Uh, it is produced in very less quantity and the subsequent conversion of SDA to EPA is just uh, is less than 6%. By bypassing this step and consuming uh, steroidonic rich acid uh, oil, um, we can uh, get around 14 to 16% of uh, EPA. Uh, Bugloside Savances uh, is a <coughs> herbaceous weed which grows in the cold temperate regions of Asia and Europe. We collected our plant uh, seeds from Pampore region, Jammu Kashmir, and it was uh, grown in uh, tropical climate that is in Mysore, uh, maintaining the oil and uh, seed yield. The oil contains uh, the B. Avensis seed oil content has around it, oil content is 20 percent, which includes an alpha linolenic acid content of 47 percent, and steroidonic acid percent about 18 to 19. Uh, here is the GC image uh, which shows the presence of uh, steroidonic acid. Uh, by transcriptome analysis, uh, we elucidated the key genes involved in uh, the tag biosynthesis pathway. Uh, they are FAT2, fatty cell desaturase 2, 3, delta 6 desaturase 1, which are involved in the synthesis of short chain omega 3 fatty acids and uh, uh, diacyl glycerol uh, acyl transferases and phospholipid diacyl glycerol acyl transferases. These help in enriching the tags with uh, short chain PUFAs. And finally, oleosine helps in the formation of oil bodies rich in this tag. Um, even though uh, Bacillus sciences can grow here, uh, it is very difficult to uh, cultivate it and because over a period of time the seed yield is less and the oil content is becoming less and also the germination rate is coming down. So we need a sustainable plant which is agronomically adapted to express our BAD60 gene and obtain STA. Uh, we chose linseed which is agronomically adapted and it also has an ILA content of 46%. Uh, it is a self-pollinated plant which is cultivated both as food and fiber crop. It is grown in many different regions of India. We uh, chose NL115 uh, strain which is developed by University of Agricultural Sciences of Raichur. Um, it has an oil yield of 39% and an ALA content of 46%. Uh, and uh, we can use this as a good uh, candidate for expressing our uh, D60 gene. Uh, before expressing characterize our genes so we go, went ahead and functionally characterized B1860 gene and also transgenically expressed it. Um, <coughs> the D60 genes uh, has two isoforms D61 and D62. Uh, they were cloned to uh, PYS2 uh, PYAC2 NTC vector and then inserted into Saccharomyces cerevisiae, I even PSC strain and the it was fed with equimolar concentrations of uh, ALA and LA and it, we checked its conversion to GLA and 
SDA. The BA D61 converted it to, to uh, GLA and SDA. It had a uh, conversion rate of 30.5% and 23%. Whereas the D62 did not convert the AL and LA. These are the GC images uh, showing that uh, BA D61 has converted the FET ALA and LA to 18.4 and 18.3, that is SDA and GLA. But uh, D60 failed to convert the ALA and uh, LA. Uh, we came to conclusion that uh, BA D62 is not a functional desaturase and D61 is a functional one. And then we uh, tangentially expressed this in uh, Arabidopsis. Uh, we express the D60 gene under the control of seed-specific oleosin promoter in Arabidopsis. And upon taking the seeds of T2 generation and uh, checking it for GC profile, we, we got very low levels of GLA and SDA, meaning that is around 0.5% to 0.6% of uh, uh, GLA content and SDA of 04 to 0.7% of the total fatty acids. Even though the quantity was less, uh, the presence of this in the seed indicates that if there is a possibility of producing uh, SDA and uh, GLA in, uh, transgenically in other plants. The low levels may be due to less content of ALA, that is precursor or absence of specific acyl transferases. Uh, we went ahead and characterized uh, the acyl, characterized the acyl transferases which are required for uh, enriching the tag pool. Uh, that is, the we characterized DGAT1, DGAT2, PDAT1 and PDAT2. Um, all these were cloned to PYC2 NTC strain and then the immunoblot assay we, was performed. The presence of the 56 kilodalton, 57.6 kilodalton uh, band confirms the presence of uh, expression of DGAT1 and 38 kilodalton confirms the presence of DGAT2. 73 and 80, 73.5 and 80.2 kilodalton confirms the presence of PDAT1 and PDAT2. <coughs> and also to confirm uh, and also the body P assay was performed to check the accumulation of oil by uh, using QM vector, QM as uh, this one, expression, uh, expression yeast. Uh, we inserted DGAT1, DGAT2, PDAT1 and PDAT2 and uh, were in, they were induced with uh, galactose and it was stained with body P and the confocal microscopic images uh, showed uh, the presence of oil droplets in, indicating that DGATs and PDATs are involved in tag synthesis. And also oleate toxicity assay was performed uh, by uh, spotting the 24-hour old culture on SM minus ura plates uh, supplemented with 2% galactose and 0.1 micromolar of oleic acid. B, uh, DGAT1, DGAT2, PDAT1 and PDAT2 were all grown and uh, they helped to restore the oil body synthesis uh, and uh, rescued QM from oleate toxicity. And uh, we got came to a conclusion that uh, the acyl transferases are involved and our requirement for uh, enriching tag and by further supplementation of oleic acid to QM uh, VADGAT2 there was more growth uh, suggesting the unsaturated fatty acid presence and its major role in tag biosynthesis in BR lenses and also the transcript abundance of VADGAT2 was high throughout the seed development when compared to DGAT1 and PDATs which tells us it is important it helps in accumulating SDA in tag. Our uh, future prospect is to transform linseed with a delta-6 desaturase gene and an acyl transferase uh, that is uh, DGAT2 to linseed and obtain steatidonic rich uh, oil. Ah. Thank you. Thank you, Danush. Yes, sir. So, any questions? I have not seen any questions there from Q&A. Okay, sir. I have one question. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Can you hear me, Danush? Yes, sir. I can hear you, sir. So, when you are over this, is there any change into the phenotype also? Or phenotype uh, is perfectly? Sir, can you please repeat the question, sir? Uh, when, when you are over expressing your gene, so is there any change into the phenotype of the plant? I mean, plant is phenotypically fine into the control line and over line? 
Uh, yes, sir. There was no change in Arabid offices this one, sir. Other than the plant was growing normally, there was no phenotypic changes. Only the seed showed very less uh, content of ALA and uh, GLA, sir. So SD and GLA. Then okay, okay, that is good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Danush, Danush, I have a small question. So, yes, sir. Have you analyzed the lipid droplet uh, index there? Uh, in your concept in confocal slides, I think I want this to your uh, drop the index. Uh, yes, sir. So, yeah, that was the one. Eight, slide number eight in that Yes, sir. Uh, what is that? How much it is coming out? Uh, I didn't understand the question, sir. Lipid droplet index. So, that is the measure that they generally will use it in that. So, maybe you can relook at it. And then, uh, yes, what sir. is this? Stability of ELA, how do you account for this? In a food format, so any of the given food formats is how stable it is. And, uh, no, sir, I will uh, look into that one. Okay. okay so, thank you. So, Venkat? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I have one question. Yes, sir. So you are talking about DGATs, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so all are all these DGATs are uh, membrane bound or cytosolic? So these are membrane bound, sir. Okay. Do you have a confirmation? Uh, sir, uh, we had uh, performed the insulin consequence. Oh, it's okay. Oh, sure. Okay, sir. <laughs> So these are uh, membrane bound, sir. Uh, by uh, in silico analysis, we got to know that one, sir. DGAT1 and DGAT2 both are membrane bound, sir. Okay. Have you come across any cytosolic DGATs? No. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. So if there are no questions, I think uh, it's my pleasure to thank Danush. Um, thank you, Danush. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, Venkat, his next speaker is there, Sir Neha. Oh, she's not available. I think she is there in the I think there may be some technical issue. Okay. From their side. So, if there are no questions, then at least we can ask Professor Devrata to conclude the session there. Uh, the, 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 this is the third, third, third participant is not there, Mr. Neha Tanwar. Yeah, Neha Tanwar is not, not there. So, okay, so so this, it was a wonderful presentation in this session. So all together there were four presentations. It was very effective. So so and thank you very much, Dr. Dinesh and the whole organizing committee. So with this note, uh, so we are ending the sessions and see you into the next session. So thank you, uh, Dr. Drepa Devabrata and uh, Dr. Vivek Babu who, for uh, uh, conducting the session as chair and co-chairs respectively. Uh, thank you for taking your time out and uh, being in the session. So what we'll do is we'll uh, join the third session uh, in the link which is sent to all of you. So please leave this session and uh, join at 2 o'clock in the new link. That will be like uh, uh, metab specialized metamolecules and uh, ecology session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you.